Yeah, good morning. Uh, thanks for joining this session. Uh, it's great to kick off this, uh, this session uh, here in the hometown uh, of Amsterdam. Uh, I want to talk you through about uh, RTL, RTL Netherlands uh, specifically. Uh, I joined RTL two years ago as a data engineer and scientist working on projects throughout the whole company. And uh, I want to show you a little bit, see how we have grown with data and how important data also has become for us uh, as a company. Um, and that's uh, particularly interesting because uh, this month we celebrated our 30 year anniversary. And actually um, this happened roughly 30 years ago in the beginning of October uh, 89. And if you, like you can see, a lot of change, not only visually and maybe the hair of our news presenters, but also in the way how we bring our content to our people. Um, because in the last couple of 30 years, we have been doing a lot of innovation. And maybe you don't know RTL from this guy, Jeroen Pau, or you know it from our daily TV shows. But if you're from an international audience, you maybe know it from Big Brother and The Voice. Uh, those are two TV shows that started at our TV channels in the Netherlands. And uh, they became a hit in our, at our channels. And then they grew out to become a worldwide breakout hit. So we always have been in our culture, it has been that you have to take some challenges, that you have to innovate, to look ahead and to see what things are new on the horizon and uh, what can we experiment with. Now, 30 years later, RTL has grown from one TV channel into multiple TV channels and even re representing a lot of other brands too. So uh, I think worldwide you hear that TV is dead or TV is dying. But we reach on TV basis every day almost 9 million people with our own channels, but also with the channels that we represent, for example, CNN and uh, big sports channels. In that way, a lot of people are still watching classical television, but are coming there for our content and want to watch it uh, on different platforms. So they also watch it online. Um, we have... Uh, roughly 800 million views on the different platforms as both our own video on demand, which will I talk about a little bit more. Uh, that's also YouTube and uh, that's also our uh, news platforms. And talking about our news platforms, we uh, have a couple of news, but also weather platforms. You can imagine that in the Netherlands, you cannot live without a weather app. So we run the biggest weather app of the Netherlands. And with that, we reach an audience of 2.3 million people. And if we will even look at a further scope, then you see that RTL Netherlands is part of the RTL group, which is a group of European television and radio stations. And that is even part of Bertelsmann, which is a worldwide uh, media uh, organization, which also runs Penguin Random House um, and uh, BMG Music uh, Publishers, for example. Okay, that for the introduction, I think you have a, quite a good context on what RTL uh, is, but you also see that things are changing. Because we have consumers that learn to love the RTL brands and products for the last 30 years. They know how to find our content, if that's The Voice, Big Brother, the weather information, the latest breaking news. But an interesting shift has happened. Back in the days, we would only just send our content to our audience with a classical TV channel where we would do the scheduling. Nowadays, you see that it's shifting around. The audience is picking the content itself. They want to see the content whenever they like it, on which platform they like it, and uh, whenever they like it. And that's quite a challenge for a TV company that used to be only organizing just in one TV channel with a schedule where the biggest programs would be on Friday evening at 8 p.m. Now, the same audience can watch that show also on Monday morning at 8 o'clock. And I can tell you, our, one of our, I'm not really proud of it, but we have a dating show that is a breakout hit. We had to postpone it and launch it in the middle of the night because people were staying up to watch that show uh, at first. People are really um, flexible nowadays in how they watch their content. And that's also where the data team comes in. I'm not doing this uh, on my own. Uh, RTL decided five years ago to invest in what we would call a big data team, a data intelligence team. 
And the team has now grown into 22 people uh, from uh, 12 nations. Matteo has joined me here uh, on the front row. And a lot of our other colleagues are uh, working uh, on the different products. And you must think of, uh, these are engineers, product owners, data scientists. We also have data analysts, but those are not part of this team. Those are more part of the different business units. But we get the freedom, but also the re responsibility to work on a wide range of data products. And we do that with this technology stack. So when we started, uh, roughly five years ago, we invested which kind of technology would work for us. Um, that was the moment that we also went for Amazon and uh, quite rapidly also for Spark. So together with EMR, we set up a very strong um, a data platform where we can organize all of our data, manage our data, but also create data products on top of it. Throughout the years, we of course have been replacing uh, different products. Um, we used to work with Azkaban, that is Airflow nowadays. We used to work with Zeppelin and uh, PyCharm a lot, that's now moving to Jupyter and uh, Visual Studio, but you see that our, our studio is still around, and even we got some SQL servers on premise, but uh, we're gonna move to Snowflake, which I heard a lot of good things about. I'm not gonna talk all of these technologies uh, individually or brag about what we all use. I think it's far more important to talk about a couple of use cases uh, to do so. And uh, I've got five use cases with me, uh, five use cases which I think give you a good impression on the wide range of products that we're working on, how we are impacting the um, uh, way consumers can consume our content and give you an impression of um, the different levels that we have from very complicated some to sometimes even uh, quite easy. So I wanna start off with personalization. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, back in the days we just had one TV channel. Nowadays, uh, people can, thanks to the internet, uh, watch content and, uh, themselves and organize it themselves. One thing where we saw that quite um, rapidly already was with news. Um, so RTL News is the biggest commercial news brand uh, on Dutch television, which has a couple of news sites. And when we were tracking in the analytics the behavior of the consumer, we saw that a lot of our consumers came via Google and Facebook, but after they read one article, they decided to go back. And that was a very strange uh, thing for our uh, journalists because back in the days, uh, you would just rely on a journalist to make a news selection for you, for a news broadcast or maybe a newspaper, and you would fully trust it. And we now saw already in our data that our users were trusting Facebook and Google more in a news selection than actually our journalists who studied for it and who were working in this field for a long time already. So that forced us uh, to work on an, uh, recommendation algorithms that maybe could challenge this news selection and also could shape our news selection better to the individual interests of our users. And uh, so this is the domain of news. We're talking about uh, articles. And we had one difficulty. Uh, our users are not logged in on our platform. And it's quite hard to track them via cookies. Uh, so we decided to go fully on a content uh, perspective and uh, work on a more personalized individual perspective later on. What did we do? What we did, thanks to Spark, is we grabbed all of our news articles and with, ju with just a simple TFIDF algorithm, we could organize and, uh, these articles. And this is what you see right here. So you see that thanks to TFIDF, we could already create some clusters between the different news articles. And if we would zoom in on one of those clusters, you would see all Dutch uh, articles about an axe scandal that uh, happened um, in the summer recently. And this was for us a uh, confirmation, but also to the journalists that without uh, annotating all of these articles, we could already create clusters and make sure that we create a relevant um, recommendation to our users. 
We were also being challenged because our editors uh, cre annotate actually all of these news articles um, with adding tags. So what we did is a simple A-B test because in the end you want to test it. On the left, uh, I have an example of articles that were being picked based on a taxonomy, so based on the tags from the users, and on the right, our TFIDF approach for an article about Trump, which of course has a lot of articles these days. And uh, let's do a little quiz. Who thinks that the taxonomy scored better? And who did thinks the TFIDF scored better? Yeah, you're all right. TFF IDF scored actually better, um, better than the taxonomy, uh, even also better than our editor's pick, which we use as a baseline. So our editors would also create on an hourly basis a list with the five most important news articles. And um, we also challenge our own algorithms by just presenting a random selection of the most recent news articles. And uh, Matteo even worked, continued on this approach by creating a word to vec uh, embeddings uh, approach that even worked better than the TFIDF uh, model. And the statistics that you see right here is that compared to this baseline of editor's picks, thanks to TFIDF, our users would um, click 23% um, more often on our news articles than those editor's picks which is super important for a news organization that strongly believes that we show and share the best news articles, that you should stay within our domain. And also from a commercial perspective, uh, we're a commercial TV company in the end, so um, we want them to stay on our platforms. We continued on with uh, Videoland, which is our VOD platform, video on demand platform. And Videoland uh, is, let's say, the Dutch Netflix. Uh, here, our users are actually logged in, uh, so we can far better track their uh, behavior and also compare their behavior. Um, what we do is um, we uh, use, in the beginning, uh, a couple of collaborative filtering algorithms, and we do that in two ways. So what we both do is like we can use the Spark library to um, create this collaborative filtering uh, algorithms, but it's also important for us to explain to our users what is actually happening under the hood. So next to the Spark library, we also manually created or recreated an item-based approach where we could recommend our users um, uh, videos within our video-on-demand platform. That worked quite well. It's an intensive job, but thanks to our cloud environment, we can scale it up. And then we move to more neural networks. Uh, why neural networks? Because we uh, want to uh, track behavior in a more complex way. So that could be, for example, uh, sequence testing. Uh, that is something that we're uh, uh, experimenting a lot with right now. Can we see some behavior not based on randomly the last 50 videos that you watched, but in the exact sequence that you watch them, and what does it say about your interest? Uh, but also, can we look inside the content, and can we see that uh, not only based on your behavior, but really based on the type of of the type of movie, the actors that are in, maybe the locations, are there similarities between movies that you watched? And in that way, can we see a far even better what your interest is? We keep on challenging with A-B tests our current models, but I must be honest, sometimes simple machine learning works better than the deep neural uh, approach, but that doesn't hold us back in uh, experimenting with uh, new methods and uh, making sure that uh, we can even present our users a better recommendation. Uh, we already did, and uh, we saw that uh, when we did that, uh, we had 30 minutes uh, more viewing time than uh, the editor strip. So the, uh, again here, we have editors who just create selections. So let's say the best action movies or with Christmas, the best Christmas movies. And we would challenge that with a personalized strip. And that means that people who would click on that strip would watch 30 minutes more 
on our platform, which is super important when you are not only ch um, competing with uh, TV and Netflix nowadays or YouTube, but also with Disney, who launched in the Netherlands thanks to uh, the great technological uh, work that the guys are doing here in Amsterdam. Okay, then I want to talk with you about emotion detection. I already uh, explained a little bit about that we are looking deeper inside of our content. And uh, when we're talking about a TV or a media organization, in the end, we're selling emotions. It's as simple as that. And it could be happy emotions because you want to be surprised or you want to, you had a long day at work or at coding and you want to watch something simple or you watching this very sad movie but that inspires you in some way or you want to be informed because we are bringing you the news or we're bringing you uh, the weather information. And so that makes it for us super important to tell, okay, what kind of emotions are in our, especially our video content, and how can we relate uh, to them? There are three approaches we use for that. Um, so we want to see it in like moving video, so face, and, uh, face detection, and then continue on with emotion detection. Uh, we want to have uh, uh, an understanding what our speakers have in emotions, so that's more text-based approach. And we also now look in audio. Just can we say something about the tone of voice of an actor, or can we uh, say something about the music that is um, being set uh, uh, or the being played in the background? A couple of examples for that. Uh, this is our soap opera. Uh, our soap opera, which is actually called Good Times, Bad Times. So you can imagine there are a lot of emotions in there. And um, this is an uh, quite a simple neural network with Keras that has been applied where you identify the face and it gives you, it tries to predict what kind of emotions um, this actor then has. So we can, instead of annotating all of this, we um, can see now for all of our uh, episodes, and this show runs for the last almost also 30 years, what kind of mixture in emotions could be successful? Um, so we have been practicing with this. If you want to try it out, there's a great grid, GitHub repository uh, about this, um, where you just pick up a Jupyter Notebook and start uh, practicing it with your, uh, with your own video content. Um, for the text-based approach, we are using BERT. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with BERT, which got released by Google last year. It's a new approach um, of an, a lang language uh, model setting. So uh, it's really important. The core idea about it is that it has a bi-directional uh, approach. So it also looks uh, back and forth between the words and the surrounding words to have an even better understanding on what this language uh, is about. And the advantage is that it's available in over 100 languages. It has been trained on a Wikipedia data set. And you can imagine for a small country with a language which is, I think, roughly spoken by 25 million people in the world, uh, we need to rely on these kind of data sources when um, most of the classical emotion detection uh, now is only available for English and a couple of other major languages. Um, the way that I, the, I wanted to address it also because um, we use BERT uh, also in other NLP tasks that we'll uh, get back to uh, later on. Um, what we did is we labeled our own data set and um, we asked users to label both subtitles and uh, video material. And uh, in that way, we could further train and improve it, but we also wanted to have this bimodal approach. Can we combine visual emotions with textual emotions and have, in that way, a better understanding of these emotions? But therefore, we also needed to have a test set. Um, the disclaimer is it's uh, quite hard. So we um, are not done uh, with, it, with it, it, absolutely not. But uh, if you see it right here, so we have on the bottom, you see the predicted labels, and on the left, you see uh, the true labels. And it's maybe a little bit hard to see, but sometimes, even in this soap opera, and I don't know if it's about the quality of the actors 
or uh, you could even maybe say that in a soap opera, emotions are even more intensive. We had a hard time in always predicting it right. And uh, it was a pity, but our current approach uh, does not have a better score uh, with a bimodal approach than if we would do it uh, individu individually. Uh, but we learned a lot from uh, this approach and creating this data set, and it's definitely something that we're uh, going to continue on with. Then, if we're talking about analyzing our content, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, talk show analysis. We run uh, a couple of talk shows every day. Uh, this is live television. This is instead of a soap opera, which is taped three months uh, ahead, and talk shows every day live, so we can directly steer to the interests of our users. But we are also curious which of our users still uh, switch on the television on, let's say, 8.30 every day to watch this talk show to tell them what the latest entertainment news is. So what we did is we have a uh, talk show about entertainment. Uh, we take uh, the scenario, but also at the same moment we have live subtitles. Uh, because of uh, we want to support um, a deaf people, we have a, a guy uh, who is actually typing along with our, with our show and creating for us in that way high quality subtitles. Uh, of course, I think in the future we'll move to speech to text and uh, make that even uh, easier. But um, there we have again the Dutch language, which is uh, quite hard. So I'm really happy that I can rely on these uh, subtitles, uh, and that we have these subtitles for a lot of our major shows. And what we actually do to, with Fuzzy Wuzzy is that we uh, match the scenario with the subtitles, and in that way, we can uh, easily identify, okay, what are the items in a show? You can imagine there's a big uh, breaking news at the beginning of the show, then you have short clips, then you later on maybe have an interview with one of those singers. And in this way, we can automatically identify uh, the segments. And if we then continue on, we created here a labeled data set which was further supported by uh, annotated data that we have from our uh, entertainment website for the last couple of years. And what we every day do is these items get classified in four major categories. Um, and there we used uh, Spark MLib again, which sounds maybe pretty simple, but works pretty good for us because um, uh, Naive Base uh, scored almost uh, 0 0.9, and uh, that's actually pretty understandable if you take into account that sometimes crime could also be entertainment, and entertainment is almost also royalty. So. Um, Sometimes even our editors are not definitely sure what it is about, but it gives us a good impression on what are the segments in our show. Uh, this is also where we are now using BERT, and BERT is not only to better predict uh, these four classifications, but we have far deeper understanding with labels that have been labeled uh, to these items uh, on a detailed level, for example, which actor uh, is uh, playing in this movie, which, which movie was it about, which concert hall, which music uh, song, that kind of stuff. And we are now training with Bert, but um, I'm not that happy about the results yet, so I could not bring it into, uh, into production yet. But I think we are closing in on also uh, having an automatic classification of our items on a detailed level, which a roughly five tags for, uh, for every item. So what do we do with this? Um, if you look at this right here, so uh, this on top, you see the viewing ratings, and uh, that is viewing ratings that our company had for the last 30 years already, no big news. Uh, in that way, TV companies has always been data-driven in some way. Um, but thanks to the matching nowadays, we can, um, show them below that, okay, which were the items. So you see on the right the titles of the different uh, uh, items that were in there. So there was an item about the rose, there was an item about uh, Sinead O'Connor, and a little bit of other uh, things. But also we can, thanks to the subtitles, we can easily show them where, which expert or presenter was actually talking in the show. So 
if you run this show on a daily basis and sometimes even on a bi-daily basis or uh, uh, twice on a day, this is for our creatives important information to uh, see what is happening in the show and then they don't need to see the show or they can easily look back, okay, what went wrong in the show a couple of weeks ago. But of course, um, we want to give them a far better overview so we can on a daily basis show them, okay, these items attracted users and, or attracted viewers and which some items users also, of a viewers also switch to other channels or maybe switch off the TV. But what I think is far more important with that classification is give, can we give them a better understanding on what is the uh, division of our show and uh, can we also show them which items work good on television and which item uh, could um, have a different audience. And, and a clear example what we have there is that in the Netherlands uh, we still have a royal house and our TV audience actually loves royalty. It doesn't matter what we uh, bring uh, on that, if it's our own royal house or even the British royal house because our own royal house is sometimes I think a bit too ordinary. Every item that we bring, viewers uh, stick with us. But if we start talking about social media influencers, uh, our audience switches to a different channel. And that gives us a, be a good understanding that we have quite an all TV, all TV audience um, that needs to be fed with these kind of subjects and that we on an online, on our website and app, we can better talk about influencers and less about uh, royalty. Uh, if we're talking about predicting what is happening on television, then it's also important for us to predict our viewing ratings. Um, what we do right here is, uh, this is an image of the total television um, on a daily basis. And you see there is a clear pattern throughout the year. Uh, also, this is an example of something that we have been doing for uh, decades already. But now uh, we wanted to challenge that and uh, switch from a manual approach or more an Excel-based approach to a uh, machine learning and even deep learning approach. Um, so what we did is we had this uh, training set and test set, and based on that we created um, a couple of components that together could give us a good understanding of those viewing ratings. So uh, we have to be honest, TV is maybe not dying, but it's definitely declining. So there's a trend component where you see that uh, TV is, is uh, declining a little bit. Um, but, and we have, of course, also a seasonal component. I think in the summer, everybody is barbecuing and uh, chilling outside while now it's being cold and rainy. Uh, people are staying inside. In that way, I have to be honest, uh, we're a bad weather company. We own a TV channel and a weather app. So for us, days like this where it's raining are actually the best. Um, we combine that with a weekday component. Of course, in the weekend, people are watching uh, more television. Um, the weather component that I uh, already addressed, and also an event component with big uh, national holidays, but also sports events like the Olympics or the World Cup. People are watching more television. Uh, but it's also interesting for us because we don't own a lot of football rights. So we have to be aware that people will be watching television, but watching television on a different channel. Um, and if we then combine this all, so you see slowly that I'm adding all of these pieces. Then you see that we have quite a good uh, model prediction. Uh, compared to what was actually uh, happening uh, in real life. Um, and if we then compare it, so we have the manual approach and then we had the data approach. And the data approach had a far smaller error. Um, uh, the percentage uh, was even better. So this was for us important also to show to, let's say, the classical TV people, this big fuss about big data could actually help you in having better predictions and better insights uh, on what is happening uh, on television and making sure that we adopt our TV, TV planning to that. Then to conclude, uh, the last example that I uh, wanted to share with you is automated trailers. Uh, why do we do this promo generation? 
So, of course, on a Friday when we broadcast The Voice, that's a huge show. We want to make a very specific, tailored uh, trailer for that. But we nowadays have a lot of other TV channels, and uh, those TV channels also during the day broadcast The Bold and the Beautiful, Flying Doctors, a little House on the Prairie, shows that you maybe cannot even imagine anymore that we are still broadcasting them. There's still an audience for that, so they need to have also a promo. And uh, that's why we started to exploring uh, promo generation. Um, a promo is important for this awareness of when people are switching the channel or um, watching a channel today that they are aware of this movie that is coming up the next day. Um, but it's costly. Currently, it's manual work, and for the people who are doing it, it's actually no fun at all. If you have to make a promo of this episode of The Bold and the Beautiful for the 50th time in a year, yeah, there's like no coolness about that. Um, and uh, with AI, we can actually identify um, uh, features in that content and automate that process. Uh, and maybe in the future, we could even start creating personalized promos. So not one promo for one episode, but if we're talking about Bold and the Beautiful, maybe you have three favorite characters, then you get a different promo compared to your neighbor or some other uh, viewer on our channel. How do we do, do this? Um, we take a video, we put this in uh, Pachyderm. Pachyderm runs a lot of models for us. Uh, it makes us, uh, currently, it's our choice for making, uh, making it easy to run those uh, models. And then uh, that delivers us features. So what are we uh, looking at? Of course, we're looking at what, what are the keyframes um, in a movie. Um, we are looking at aesthetics. So does it look good? Is this uh, material that we can use in a promo? Of course, you want to see the shots. Uh, we want to have visual similarity. That's not directly something for a promo, but we could use for other purposes. For example, cutting out recaps and breaks and that kind of information. Of course, object detection, if we want to have a better understanding of what is happening in there. Uh, what is the optical flow of a movie? And uh, already addressed face detection and uh, emotion recognition. And if we put this all together, then uh, we can create automatic uh, trailers. And actually, that's something that we're doing, we've been doing already. Uh, so I have another quiz for you. I'm gonna show you three trailers, and afterwards I'm gonna ask you which of these trailers uh, is not made by a computer. Okay, those were the three trailers. Uh, now the question is to you. Who thinks that trailer number one was created by a human? Who thinks that trailer number two was created by a human? And who thinks that trailer number three was created by a human? The right answer is trailer number two. Um, and there is a very simple thing that actually one of our promo directors recently shared with us where he directly knew that this could not be a human and I think if you look at the head of this guy, this actor, it's not, really, not very clear visual, it's like you see only half of his head and that is something that a human would never do. But with this information, with this tip, we can of course easily adopt our uh, model and make sure that if we recognize a face, that the full face should be visible within the trailer. So in that way, creativity and data come together. Uh, but actually, uh, the second uh, was this a uh, trailer that was created by a human, and the other two were created by uh, the computer. Then to conclude, so what this is, uh, what we're doing on making sure that people can watch what they want, whenever they want, and wherever they want it. 
um, that is strongly nowadays supported by different data products. So personalization, emotion detection, talk show analysis, ratings forecasting, automatic trailers, and we're even doing a lot more. Things that I could not share yet or things that would not fit it. If you want to know more about it, uh, come talk to me. Or if you want to contribute to it or think that you can even do it better, then um, we're hiring. Uh, so uh, more than welcome uh, to talk with you uh, more about it. But now I'm, uh, I'm ready to get challenged uh, with a couple of questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maurice. That was awesome. Love the uh, technical details you had in there. Yeah, yeah we do have a, a couple of minutes for questions, so I'll be walking around. Thank you. It was very good. I just have one question about the emotion detection. Did you try to use group? Like when you do with one face, it's much harder. But if you have a emotion detection on a on a frames that have more than one person, yeah, like three, four, a group of people, then I think that it might help you to do this emotion detection better. If five people are laughing in a group of six, this is a happy uh, frame, then so this is what I... Uh, this, this is actually an interesting approach, and I think I w we should definitely look into that. Uh, but I think then you need to have a certain threshold of um, when you know that all persons have the same emotion. If we, for example, if you say that a person comes with, with shocking news and tells his family about it, uh, then you see maybe one neutral emotion and one shocked emotion. And uh, sometimes it could be also opposites. So then it's not um, making it stronger, but making it even like more uh, diffuse. And that's also that we, an issue that we had while we were labeling the data. Um, a lot of our uh, users that we asked to label the data gave sometimes as feedback when we had multiple faces in there that they could not make a choice out of these three uh, or uh, out of these seven emotions that we suggested to to them. But I think it's an interesting approach if you could say if all of the users or at least more than half of the users that gives a good impression on what this scene or this moment is about. Thanks. Yes, uh, thanks for your talk. It, I think it was great. You showed a lot of different things, and it's really interesting what you're doing. I have a question about the talk show analysis, because it's maybe a bit more on the philosophical side, but how, how do you see like giving people what they want or deciding for them what they want? Because you show per element, like do you get more viewers or less viewers if the, you show this? And I think YouTube also had this thing where by just giving people what they want, they, their algorithm was suddenly suggesting all kind of conspiracy uh, videos. And I think it also goes, if you think more of a commercial uh, perspective, like do you just want to grow your current audience or do you want to attract a new audience? What's your perspective on uh, just showing what works and uh, trying out new stuff when it comes to that? Yeah, no, that's, uh, I agree with you that we not only, uh, we want to, do not want to drop our journalistic principles uh, in favor of data and say we're just going to go for what scores best. Uh, also because uh, uh, there are a lot of other restrictions uh, to that. And what I think also there is uh, important to, to highlight, it's always been in, in discussion and we're indeed struggling with can we in some way uh, visualize our data quite simply so that these creatives who our total data noobs still understand what is happening, but uh, you still also want to provide context. Because, for example, if another show stops uh, or goes into a break, then people are switching the channel to our um, show. And does that mean that this specific item with this expert was the best uh, thing that you could talk about, or was it just today and tomorrow? It's, it's something different if you schedule it uh, wrong or uh, differently. Uh, so there we look more at what kind of trends do we see, and we give them really as a suggestion how they could adopt uh, the show, but uh, for for discussion and definitely not a short list with uh, this talk show should only talk about. Um, fires, murders, royalty, 
and uh, new music albums. Um, but uh, it's, it, it, it's a domain where we're, we're looking into. Also because we want to apply to news and there it's very strict, of course, with uh, journalistic uh, principles. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the great talk, first of all. Uh, question regarding personalization. Uh, you stayed more on the item based, as far as I understand. That's because of the limitations that you have on the user data. But if you didn't have any limitations, according to your experience and your knowledge, what is the best in class algorithm for recommendations? Which one would you use and would you go for? Mateo, can I, uh, what would you suggest? Mateo is, is, is doing a lot of personalization uh, in our team. We've been discussing that, I think. Uh... Um, so it depends. Uh, for item base, uh, we, we are doing this item base in the news. It's because we'll, we don't have uh, uh, the login of the users. Uh, but uh, for the, the video land use case, uh, we are using the, the personalized part. Uh, and, uh, and there we have an algorithm that is uh, running on sequences and that's the one that is uh, re giving us right now the best uh, results. Uh, so uh, when you consume many items, whether we are talking about uh, video or articles, uh, uh, if we have the, the um, if we can track the users uh, in the uh, news platform, then we will probably also uh, try the, the sequence algorithm. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid we're running out of time. So if you have more questions for Maritz uh, or Matei, uh, feel free to just <laughs> find them around. Um, but yeah, we need to take a short break and then we'll have another session here. But uh, don't forget to, to rate the session. Oh in yeah. the app. And once again, thank you very much for the speaker. Thanks. Thank you.